Hello, you're listening to the Art History Symposium, brought to you by the University of California at Davis. With every episode, we'll bring you the latest in art historical research from faculty, students, and alumni of UC Davis. Before we begin with our fall 2009 season, we thought we'd play catch up and introduce Lucinda White Fratschenberg. Lucinda received her MA in June of 2009. Her main area of research is in photography, with a focus on the late 20th century and issues of gender and representations of women. Her undergraduate studies consisted of photography as well as dance from the University of New Mexico. What you're about to hear is her thesis presentation titled, Ruptures in Truth, Thomas Aikens and the Pictorialist Vision. Enjoy. Thomas Aikens is perhaps best known today as the painter of the Gross Clinic. His legacy has been shaped by his deep interest in science, and he has been said to epitomize, quote, the character of American art as it has been constructed, realist, uncompromising, independent, and masculine, unquote. Given Aikens' interest in both science and realism, it is not surprising that he was an avid amateur photographer who produced hundreds of photographs in the latter decades of the 19th century. What is surprising, however, is the visual qualities of these photographs. Photographs which indicate an aesthetic sensibility not commonly associated with Aikens as a painter. One might expect Aikens' photographic work to document modern life or to look like the scientific photography of the time. Instead, his photography indicates a preoccupation with romanticized subject matter, including blurred landscapes and idealized nudes. Despite this visual evidence, Aikens' association with realism, his use of photography for painting studies, as well as his interest in scientific advances, continues to render most scholars blind to the possibility that Aikens' photography constituted a significant body of artistic practice. This research begins then with the question, what would it mean if Aikens' photographs were to be taken seriously as art? To answer this question, Aikens must be re-examined in light of the early American pictorialist movement. The art of painting, with all of its lingering associations with the traditional and its assumed connection to a subjective human experience, stood in the 19th century in opposition to photography's ability to objectively document the world. Photography was a product of modernity, which then returned images of modernity to an audience eager for evidence of its own progress. In a rejection of this, the pictorialists sought to suppress photography's association with the mechanical process by making photographs that looked more like paintings. Pictorialism can most broadly be defined as the attempt to claim artistic legitimacy in photography by refusing to make forefront all the veracity which photography naturally excelled at. In many ways, pictorialism represented a negating set of rules and beliefs that belied the very features which made photography a unique medium and instead attempted to connect photography to the history and the rules of fine art. Although Aikens' photographs hold obvious visual parallels to pictorialism, the connection between Aikens' photography and the pictorialist vision is a surprising one, given Aikens' apparent ideological commitments. However, photography seems to have allowed Aikens a place to explore an imaginative, expressive romanticism that his paintings do not address. That contradiction, that a scientific medium would allow a realist artist a place to be less concerned with realism, is the focus of this research. And here I show you some examples of Aikens' photography. He produced such a large body of work um, that it's impossible for me to adequately address it um, in the scope of this talk. So I hope these images here will impart a better general sense of his visual aesthetic. Aikens, while obviously influenced by pictorialism, was using his visual aesthetic to somewhat different ends. I would suggest that Aikens did not position his photography in opposition to science, but rather used its mechanical properties to allow a free play of artistic concerns. This distinction between Aikens' point of view and pictorialism, while subtle, is nonetheless crucial for an understanding of him as a pictorialist photographer. My argument is supported by the research of Michael Legia, who in his book, Looking Askance, Skepticism and American Art from Aikens to Duchamp, discussed Aikens' use of realist principles and science in painting. Against the prevailing definition 
definition of what constituted realism, Leger proposed that Athens was trying to, quote, remake realism for a world of illusionism and deceptions, unquote. Leger points to what he calls discordances in Aikens' paintings to support his claim that Aikens was committed to both scientific truth and artistic truth, truths which do not always agree. Leger then states that the scientific knowledge sought after by Aikens was actually an obstacle to his realism, and that Aikens constantly fought with the limits of the seen world and his desire to paint the truth. Leger makes the complex argument that Aikens' desire for realism desire for scientific truth, and desire for artistic profundity were constantly juxtaposed in his paintings. This merging of differing sets of optical truths inserts ruptures into the paintings, ruptures between the scientific and the artistic. I suggest that these same optical ruptures are present and visible in Aikens' photographic work, and that although visually very different, Aikens grappled with similar issues in the photographic medium in his painting. The ruptures in Aikens' photographs challenge both the mechanical and the aesthetic expectations of photography. In this way, Aikens enters a dialogue about art which questions truth, a dialogue fundamental to modernity and provoked by the camera. Out of the large collection of Aikens' photographic work, Two particular subjects emerge as significant towards understanding the particular pictorialist vision of Thomas Aikens, the landscape and the nude. Landscape, although a little remarked upon portion of Aikens' photography, was a crucial genre for pictorialists. The landscape genre had immediate associations for a contemporaneous audience with painting and the popular sweeping vistas of the newly explored West, as well as scenes of East Coast wilderness, such as those by the Hudson River School. Early pictorialists used the association between landscape and painting to their advantage, attempting to show that photography could capture nature in similarly expressive and romantic terms. A photograph by John Moran from 1871 of the edge of a body of water between a pebbled bank and a background of mountains and sky demonstrates Moran creating a landscape photograph which could be compared favorably to a painting. As intentionally composed as a large-scale landscape painting, Moran employs a balance between foreground of earth, middle ground of water, and background of mountains and sky to give harmony to the image. A single arch of a branch caught in the water mimics the arch of the mountain in the background and creates a focal point for the composition as a whole. Additionally, Moran uses the mist rising off the water to lend his image an out-of-focus quality that would become a hallmark of the pictorialist. In contrast, although also carefully composed, an image by William Henry Jackson emphasizes detail and veracity. In this photograph, Jackson captures a lone train engine running between a cliff face and a body of water. The semicircle of the train track is elegant against the looming cliff which dwarfs the engine. Images of the West, such as this one, often feature composition, compositions which highlight both the presence of man's advances into nature and the technological aspects of photography by insisting on extreme levels of detail and crisp focus. The sharpness of this photograph is consistent from foreground to background, underscoring the machine-like perfection of both the railroad and the camera itself. In comparison to these two photographs, an early landscape photograph by Aikens shows an interest in composition, space, and pattern. An image of a grassy field snaked through with narrow loops of water and bisected at the top by a straight horizon line, this photograph achieves an unusual amount of flatness. The foreground pours down towards the viewer and takes two-thirds of the image space. The background with its sharp horizon line and oddly straight row of trees masks any sense of distance and depth. Aikens, even here in his early experimentation with the tools of photography, shows an awareness of shaping the final image rather than just capturing a scene. This creation of a landscape through manipulation of photography's formal properties could be said to lessen the accuracy of the scene and therefore be a part of the pictorialist vision. In contrast to Aikens' highly studied approach to painting, his photographs, 
While they cannot be removed from photography's insistence on a singular point of view, allow a different sort of looking. Unlike his paintings, which stress the formula of the grid and a fixed mathematical relationship of viewer to image, this landscape photograph confronts a viewer with the evidence of the real world, but one which refuses to conform to the idea of a linear perspective. The most problematic of Aikens' photographs are those of the new figure. While this genre is the most prolific of Aikens' body of photographic work, the motivations behind his nude studies have never been clear. Although nude photographs can suggest a relationship to pornography or erotic imagery, it is clear that Aikens' nudes were not pornographic and do not fit the conventional visual modes of erotic photography. His nudes rarely look at the camera and do not display the coyness or lewd postures associated with pornography. His nudes and landscapes are most often engaged in a quiet activity or a moment of their own. They are, however, visually distinct from the later pictorialist nudes, which often use symbolic props or extreme softening of the image through manipulation of focus. In Three Crowell Boys Nude, Outdoors at Avondale, Pennsylvania, Aikens creates a photograph which prefigures a later pictorialist image by Clarence H. White from 1905. Aikens' photographs suggest both the romantic sensibility of nude youth out in nature and also presents a realism that is absent in the later photograph by White. In Aikens' image, he placed his three young nephews outdoors. On the right, one boy leans against a tree branch with one knee propped up and his head down in the corner of his elbow. The two other boys stand on the left and turn away from the camera. All three are framed between two large trees and a wooden fence is just visible in the distance. All three of the bodies have a solidity and a physicality that makes their nudity all the more uncomfortable for the viewer. In contrast, White's photograph removes all sense of time and place, allowing his youth to become a classical figure of Apollo or Adonis. White also posed a young boy outdoors, nude, and formed his composition by framing the figure between trees. The boy in the white photograph faces away from the camera, holding a bow and arrow above his head. The boy's entire body is stretched with suggested action, unlike Aikens' models that merely wait for the shutter release. There are no signs of a man-made environment in Boy with the Bow, unlike the suggestion of the fence in Aikens' photograph. White's model convincingly embodies a classical pose and blends into the nature he is placed in, his vertical posture mimicking that of the tree. The difference between these two photographs may be conveyed through the idea that, as Mary Panzer states, quote, Aikens did not believe that human beings required the improving hand of the artist to make them beautiful. He welcomed any image that offered an uncensored view of the human form. Unquote. In Aikens' photograph, we see the uncensored human bodies of these children, awkwardness included. He makes the viewer aware of the model's physicality through the fact of the body's effort and stillness. At the same time, however, this image embodies an aesthetic which I believe still connects to the pictorialist ideals. Aikens clearly uses an artist's composition, placing the three figures within the space of the two trees and contrasting the two straight bodies on the left against the curled one on the right. The connection of the new form to nature itself is a pictorialist motif, which Aikens prefigures. And although he does not romanticize the bodies themselves, he creates an image which tells us more about its maker than it does its subjects. Aikens' photograph of his three nephews, which in many ways appears pictorialist, still does not attain the romanticism of the similar photograph by White from two decades later. In Aikens' photograph, although the subject matter remains one which pictorialists embrace enthousi enthusiastically, the effect of the image is quite different producing a discomfort that hinges on the obvious corporeality of the three boys. Unlike the white photograph, which assumes a mythical and otherworldly quality that is undisturbed, Aikens' photograph cannot hide the realism of its subjects, as romantic as the setting and poses may be. Aikens never lost the fascination with the mechanics of the body, even in his least scientific images, such as this one from approximately 1890. In this photograph, Aikens' wife, Susan, and his horse, Billy, stand together outdoors amid the leaves of small trees. 
Susan is shown nude with her back to us and her arms draped along Billy's neck. This photograph is startling in both its poetic and frank qualities. The body is rendered very clearly with attention to the spine and the muscles of the back. Susan Akins is delicate against the solidity of the horse with her scapula and deltoid creating a perfect triangular room. And rendered in the black and white of photography, her skin tone and the coat of the horse become nearly the same tone of pale gray. In this photograph, Akins makes an image of tenderness, tactility, and sensuality. He suggests connections between nature, animals, and women that are poetic in a way his paintings never were. His use of space and composition can be directly related to the ideas and work of the pictorialists. At the same time, this photograph refuses to be fully pictorialist and retains some amount of realism, acting, as Lija suggested, as a hybrid or a link between the different optical truths of science and experience. Although the subject matter is consistent with pictorialism, the insistent physicality of the horse and the woman without any softening of either the photograph itself or of the narrative is a realist vision of the scene. As with many of Aikens' paintings, the realism here does not rely on exact replication, but rather on details, which directly engage the viewer with the challenge of seeing. The precise wing of Susan's scapula and the tactile sense of the horse's warmth both demand that the viewer perceive not only a lyrical mood, but also a real flesh and blood moment. Aikens, by using painting, to explore realism, and using photography to explore the expressive, switch the expected roles of these mediums. His project of using a mechanical process to access the romantic impulses is a parallel project to his painting, but also diametrically opposed. He was certainly, as Lija claims, refusing to be contained by a definition of either realism or any of his so-called opposition. Perhaps, as Lija asserts, this refusal was not merely a contrarian reaction against traditional models, but an attempt to engage his viewers in his project of linking scientific truth to artistic truth. As Leger claims, Aikens' Akins's, quote, pictorial discrepancies and fractures, among other devices, positioned viewers outside the work and elicited a critical analytical scrutiny, unquote. I believe that Aikens' photography similarly positioned view viewers to scrutinize their own expectations of visual truth. Aikens created photographs over and over again that are not merely scientific experiments or painting studies. He intentionally composed, arranged, and printed photographs which speak of a romanticism not associated with his definition as a realist painter. Aikens' realism can be understood to be a part of his photographs and indeed a part of his pictorialism, which implies the limitations of these categories altogether. His use of realism, science, and pictorialism is not lessened by their combination. Instead, it suggests Aikens' important grappling with the very notion of seeing itself. I suggest that Aikens began from the pictorial vision, one which is inherently romantic, and pointedly on the side. Thank you very much. And then subtly undercut these very qualities with an eye of the real. This contradiction, seen especially in light of his photographic work, marks Aiken as a harbinger of a disillusionment with modernity. His photographic romanticism, usually denied an important place in scholarship, can now be seen to signify a prescient engagement with the 20th century modernism's conflicted yeah, relationship sure. to objective and subjective truths. Um, Thank you.
thinking of the sort of the use of women perspective and the way that <coughs> deal with his painting, he's known for being very specific and very careful about plotting out, you know, the grids of women perspective mm -hmm. and um, proportion, mathematically, all those things. And it seems like in his landscape photographs, he is able to kind of move away from that and actually, you know, use flatness and use other, see other things. It, it gets there. So you're, you're suggesting that while they, the, the landscapes and the um, nudes have certain factors in common, there are actually procedural distinctions between those two categories as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I haven't actually thought, I'm sure I could address the sort of the use of the landscape within the nude photography and the linear perspective within. Those but even just well. you know the, the, the pattern of geometry that, that's so routine in nineteenth century composition is still there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank Something you. I'll have to keep looking into. Yes. Um, I have a question also about uh, the nudes and conversation photography. Um, I was interested in what you said about White's image of the boy with the bow when you're comparing it to the image of his three nephews, um, and you had said I think you said that. Um, while White's young boy was like in motion and about to shoot the bow, Akron's young boys were like waiting for the button to be pushed on this. And it's interesting because when we look at those um, like figure studies that he took, all of those images were like humans in motion. And I was wondering if you thought maybe his pictorialist needs would be specifically human figures like just waiting. I don't know what you thought. I just wanted to know. Yeah, I mean, there does seem to be a distinction. Um, Akins was also involved in taking a lot of photographs that corresponded to his teaching um, at the Pennsylvania Fine Art Academy. And so they were, you know, studies of bodies forms <coughs> and studies for paintings. And many of those are in the, the real typical classical motion poses and showing the way the muscles work. Um, while his more, what I'm calling pictorialist, nude images do seem to contain this pervasive sort of stillness, the sense of the models waiting and posing instead of feeling in action. Um, so yeah, there does seem to be, you know, a specific aesthetic you know, response that he's having when he's making those nudes that is really distinct from the, the others. Two questions. One is, what do we know about his darkroom technique? And what relation has he got to Jerome and Jerome's use of the photograph and his obsession with it? Yeah, um, we don't know that much about his darkroom technique. Um, Aikens really never exhibited his photographs publicly in his lifetime, so we don't know that much about his working methods. Um, he did print some platinum photographs, though. In fact, the ones I showed, uh, the, the nudes anyway, are platinum photographs, which indicate, you know, a, a deeper knowledge of the process. And platinum processing is more in depth than um, just. Well, I was thinking of print states. You can tell from print states just what he's done. Has anybody done any work on this? The state of the existing prints. You will do photographs. Yeah. Or the existing photographs. Yeah, I mean, his, his photographs have really been under study. Um, there's a large body of his work that wasn't actually sort of discovered or made public to scholars until 1985. Um, and so since then, people have been looking at that. But there hasn't been a lot of work done. And in fact, the kind of the state of the prints itself has been used to say that he wasn't a serious photographer because the prints were often small and um, they didn't, weren't given titles or dates and you know, they were often torn or haphazard or not cataloged. Are these contact prints? Um, most of them are, yes. And a, a lot of them were found just as glass plate negatives also and so then they've been made into modern prints. Um, and as far as for the second question, he studied, um, Aiken studied with Sharon in in, in Paris um, before, right about the time he was learning photography, most likely. 
So there, there is a connection there, certainly. Does he mention in his correspondence or whatever uh, any attachment that he had with Jerome in this quarter? I mean, not many people by mid-century were using the photograph all of the time. Yeah. Whether it's the same in Paris, especially, but also in, in London. Yeah, I think he does mention Jerome a lot in his letters, um, but he doesn't mention learning to use account specifically. So. Well, I just had a um, follow-up on Seymour's question about the states of the prints. Um, so uh, have there been discovered um, uh, the different versions of the prints so you can see that the artist was trying to do a lighter darker, you know, working with different techniques, trying to burnish in you know, just that, so, so you, we could determine, or you could, not you, but you could determine, uh, um, people like you could determine more his thought processes or choices for what he was trying to say. Yeah, um, I think in general there doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence that he was particularly concerned with the kind of dark room techniques and cropping images doing all those things that the pictorialists then do all sort of, you know, become really, um, becomes really crucial for them. Um, <coughs> it seems like his relationship with photography was more about taking the images and then making these contact work prints and, you know, and seeing them. But then because he also, he never exhibited images, and so he kind of, off, most often did not ever go beyond the kind of thought of them as sort of study works more than anything else? Well, that is, that has been the argument uh -huh. to sort of not consider him as a photographer, basically. Um, but I think that there are a couple things. I mean, one is just my general feeling that you don't have to be obsessed with the dark room to be considered a photographer. Um, and that his you know, just the glass plates left behind themselves, even ones that we don't know if they were ever printed, can still indicate a specific visual goal, yeah, you know. Um, and two, we also know that many of his work, his photographs in particular, were destroyed when he died, um, because especially these nude images <coughs> were considered sort of in, inappropriate or controversial, and he had already had um, issues in his lifetime, getting in trouble for doing inappropriate things, that um, it's kind of known that his friends when he died took it upon themselves to you know, help clean up his legacy and get rid of stuff. Yeah. Um, so it could be that, that there, there is that evidence that was there and was not lost. Yeah. I thought your opinion was very convincing. I, 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 I don't challenge it. I'm just <coughs> increasingly curious. I had a question for Lucinda. I, I thought your talk was very interesting. It seems to be that you're suggesting that um, Aiken's um, photographs are a little more romantic and uh, his paintings are a little more scientific, which is kind of the opposite of what we generally you know, associate paintings with romanticism and photographs with mechanical. So I was curious if you thought specifically about um, the photograph of his wife and the horse, if the sitters had anything to do with it, if he, you know, if he's observing these things from nature that maybe he didn't have any intentions of planning out kind of this romanticism that ends up in, you know, the absence of in his paintings. Yeah, so maybe the thought that he was just documenting, observing, observing and documenting instead of setting up. Yeah, like how much um, maybe her influence, the model's influence mm -hmm. had. Yeah, I mean, that, that comes up too because there are also a number of photographs which exist in which Aikens appears in the photograph also new. And so then you get into the issue of, okay, well, you know, well who's the photographer then? Right? If someone else is, is pressing the button, is he the kind of author of these or not? Um, but I think that sort of that confusion aside, um, it seems to me that the nudes in particular are too, too deliberate, A, and B, too unusual for the time period to have not been set up, to not really be an aesthetic, you know, I am trying to create a specific vision, a specific image. Um, 
I mean, it seems to me like it'd be kind of unusual to go out for a picnic with your wife and for her to wind up naked with a horse. I don't know. <laughs> he seems like he's directing that. Like he is really making that image happen. But, um, but there are some other nudes of his where it is more just people laying around in the grass, or maybe. But but this is a really conservative time. I mean, um, you know, Philadelphia was particularly a kind of conservative you know, area, and um, we got in a lot of trouble for engaging in nudity with the students. So it seems that it was um, much more deliberate, for, you know, really from him, really coming from his vision. Um, although it's hard to know how much his wife was also an artist, and we don't know how much input she had. To find out more information on the people and events affiliated with the Art History Symposium, please visit our website at www.ucdavis.edu forward slash art history. You can also look us up on Facebook under Art History UC Davis. Your feedback and commentary is always welcome. This has been the Art History Symposium, brought to you by the University of California at Davis. Thanks for listening.